Welcome back to Dielectric Videos. On today's episode, we're going to be revisiting the Bolt Power G06. Now I've had this for about two and a half years now, and it's served me incredibly well. I've gotten a few hundred charge cycles out of it. I've started probably 15 or 20 cars, and it's really done a great job of, uh, of performing up to its, all of its requirements. It's really great for school when I'm using my laptop for an extra 19 volt charge supply, and the USB port is also a nice feature for just general use. Unfortunately, as is the case with lithium batteries as they age, the internal resistance has gone up quite substantially in this, and the overall capacity has reduced to about half of its original nominal value. When I uh, last used this to try and start jumpstart a car, it really had an extremely tough time doing it, which indicates that the internal resistance has gone outside of the range of what uh, is optimal for a battery like this. So what we can do is we'll have a crack at taking it open uh, or taking it apart and I'll show you what's inside and we can see if we can figure out what the problem is. So now that I've removed all of the clips from the sides of this chassis, I've revealed the inside of the battery pack. As you can see here, the largest component visible is the battery itself. It's a 3S lithium polymer pack, 5500 milliamp hours. But you can also see this is the DC to DC converter board and charging control board. Now this board has a couple of small inductors for the USB, a big inductor for the DC output, and another small inductor to control the flashlight. Additionally, wires go over to the top side for the emergency road flare light. Now one interesting feature of this configuration is the, ba the balancing and battery management are not actually on this control board. They instead are mounted on this external board which is attached to the side of the battery. This connects to the uh, main power board just with a couple of direct uh, positive and negative leads. So the full 11.1 .1 volts from the battery is delivered to the board and all the balancing takes place on this board through these chips. In order to show you what the root cause of the problem, i.e. the increasing internal resistance and decreasing capacity is, I'll be removing the battery pack from this assembly and showing you that up close. So now I've removed the battery from the case and as you can see, the root of the problem lies in that this battery has a substantial amount of evolved gas in it. It's puffed out much farther than it would normally be from the factory. And this is fairly normal as lithium batteries age, especially under heavy discharging use like starting car engines. However, what it does is it causes the ionic resistance between the anode and cathode plates in the battery to increase substantially. This means that the amount of current that the battery can deliver before its voltage sags to an unsatisfactory level is much lower than it would have been originally. Additionally, the general wear and tear on the battery over time reduces its capacity due to side reactions in the, in the chemistry that eventually result in the battery losing its ability to store uh, chemical energy, store electrical energy as chemical energy. So between those two effects, this battery pack has basically, uh, basically been used through its entire useful life and now is going to need to be replaced. So to do that, I've purchased a 75C to 150C peak 6600 milliamp hour lithium polymer pack. It's very, very similar in construction and size to this one, uh, except this is only a 5500 milliamp hour cell or pack whereas this is a 6600 milliamp hour pack. So not only is this going to provide a similar level of high discharge rate that should be capable of starting car engines, but it also has a significantly higher overall energy uh, storage capacity, meaning that the power brick will last longer than it did originally once this is installed. The only problem here though, as I mentioned, the battery management system is on this, this external board and what's connected to the actual uh, control circuit board is only a positive and negative output, no intermediate cell uh, connectors for balance charging. This pack, on the other hand, has a nearly identical connector, but each of these individual wires corresponds to a separate cell, because this is meant to be balanced during charging. Now, a brief overview of why you might want to balance, or why you need to balance these packs, is because if any one of these cells is charged over 4.2 volts, it will uh, cause extreme damage to the battery and can even present a fire hazard. And since the cells are not all totally identical, during the charging process, one of the cells may rise to a slightly higher voltage than the other. 
Now, if your criteria for cutoff is just charging up to 12.6 volts, that is 4.2 volts times three cells, you may not realize that one of the cells could be charging much higher than the 4.2 volt maximum, creating a problem. That's where a balanced charging board like this one comes in. These little circuit, uh, these ch this chip and these MOSFET packages work to basically shunt out any excess uh, current from cells that uh, that are being charged and they've re when they've reached their maximum charge voltage. As a result, all of the cells are maintained at a maximum of 4.2 volts and no single cell is allowed to discharge or to overcharge. Now one of the things you'll probably maybe be able to see on the camera is that these MOSFET packages have actually melted slightly through this, uh, this packing tape that's, peel that's uh, pulled over them. This indicates that these cells are not well matched anymore at least one of these cells has become substantially uh, lower in capacity than its neighbors and as a result the balancing MOSFETs have been having to dissipate a whole lot more heat energy during the charging process in order to keep the pack generally balanced. That's just another indication that this pack is essentially worn out and will need to be replaced with its new replacement. So now we'll move on to beginning the replacement process and in the first step to do that, we're going to be removing the balance, uh, battery balancing board. Now before we start this process, I want to note that because lithium polymer batteries have an extremely high internal discharge capacity, they can generate an enormous amount of heat if short-circuited. They also contain a flammable organic electrolyte that can create a fire hazard if excessive heat is uh, put in contact with it. So before doing any modifications to a lithium polymer pack, it's a good idea to have a fire containment vessel, like a metal bucket filled with sand, on hand, as well as an, a fire extinguisher that's rated for electrical fires, such as an ABC material fire extinguisher. So with that in mind, uh, proceed if you're going to do a modification like this at your own risk, and be sure and be prepared to take on the risks associated. So the first thing we're going to do in order to remove the battery management board from the end of the battery is we're going to take the uh, layers of tape off that are holding the balancing board to the battery. Now be very careful not to allow any of the wires to touch any of the other wires because this will short out the battery and will create a substantial uh, fire risk. So now that we've exposed this board, we want to begin removing the balancing leads using a soldering iron. Be careful not to let the soldering iron touch any part of the battery during this process as that will also create a fire hazard. Now, I've never taken off one of these boards myself, so this is actually going to be sort of a learning experience, and uh, if anything exciting happens, you'll of course get to see it on camera. But intuitively, I'm going to start off with the highest, uh, the highest voltage battery lead, which is the red battery lead. I'm going to remove that one, then the next one down, which is the plus B1, then the plus B2, and then the B minus. Now, the reason I'm doing that is because intuitively, the, this balancing chip is probably going to be powered relative to the ground or the B minus. So we want to allow this entire circuit to remain powered for as long as possible. That way one of these MOSFETs doesn't clamp shut and create a, uh, a short circuit if something were to uh, go erratically wrong in the chip. So we'll just take the top cell and the next and the next until we get all the way down to just the remaining ground connection and then by removing it the board will be completely free. Now we don't want to disconnect either of these uh, wires going to the, to the original PCB because if we disconnect these, we're going to end up uh, having to just reattach them later when we reuse this board with the new battery. So I'm going to get some materials ready so that we can uh, carefully mark off and separate these wires once they're desoldered because we don't want them to touch together and create a short circuit. So here I've gotten some electrical tape, and I've applied a piece of electrical tape over the adjacent balancing lead to the one we're going to be removing. This is going to make sure that it's much less likely that we would accidentally short out, short out the balancing leads together. Since each individual lead is connected directly to a cell, letting any two leads touch will result in the full discharge current of that cell being dumped across them, and more than likely the lead will burn up and be never usable again. So now another tool you're going to want to have on hand is a set of needle nose pliers. This is to make sure that when, uh, when you're reaching in and desoldering, you can have fine control over the positioning of the wire. So I'll switch the camera angle and then we'll be able to actually remove this wire. So now that I've zoomed in a bit, we're now going to go in with the soldering iron and the needles, needle nose pliers and we're going to remove this wire from the board. So 
hold the wire carefully with the pliers, heat the solder locally with the soldering iron, and now it's been disconnected. But we're not out of the woods yet. If this wire comes into contact with any other part of the circuit board, it may very well cause a short circuit. So I'm going to hold the wire with my fingers, and now I'm going to take a small piece of electrical tape that I've already cut, and I'm going to pull that wire out of the way and wrap it in that electrical tape. So you want to make sure the tape uh, stays on and stays secure. That looks like it should be good enough. Now we can move on to the next wire. I'll be using a similar process through the remaining wires, so I'll do this off camera and show you the results. So I've successfully removed the battery balancing board, and I've taped off all of the remaining wires to the balance leads of the battery. Now this battery I may save for a future project, and if you're going to store a battery, especially a puffed one like this, you want to put it in something that's completely fire resistant, in case it were to spontaneously fail. That's very unlikely, but as is the case with these batteries, it's always better to be safe than sorry when storing them. So I'll set this one aside, and now we can be, uh, continue with the remainder of this project, wherein we install this balancing board on the new batteries based on its balancing leads, and we then modify these wires to suit the correct length for the pack and install an, a female EC5 connector to these wires. So we'll get started. So after testing the battery voltages with a multimeter on the original pack, I determined that I was actually mistaken as to what each balancing lead does. It turns out 1B plus is actually the positive lead of the first cell in the pack, then 2B plus, and then B plus. Uh, 2B plus is not the first cell in the pack, even though it's directly adjacent to B minus. So that would be very important to know when we install these new balance leads, because if we did it backwards, it would very likely destroy this balancing board. So the safest way to remove this balancing uh, connector and install each individual wire on the balancing board is to do it one conductor at a time, or one cell at a time. It's very important to make sure that we, do it, we don't ever allow two of these to touch or connect at a time, so that's why when you get your wire cutters out, you want to only remove one per go. So we're going to start out with the negative so that we can build up from the negative cell all the way up. So we want to cut it as close to this connector as we can. We've disconnected that wire. You can strip back a little bit. This is fairly soft insulation, so you can use your fingernails or a wire stripper to remove that. And what you want to do now is pre-tin the conductor with some solder. I'm using 6040 for this. This is just going to make it flow onto the board more easily. You can clean your soldering iron in a tip cleaner if you wish. And then we have to align the board and get it as close as we can to the, uh, the B minus connection. So if you look closely, I'll zoom the camera in for you. We have B minus, which is where the negative goes, B plus, which is where the positive goes, 1B plus, which is where the first cell above negative goes, and 2B plus, which is where the second cell above negative goes. So starting from negative, we're going to install our negative wire to B minus. In the next wire up, we'll go to 1B plus, the next one to 2B plus, and then the red wire to B plus. So we'll get started here. Our pre-tinned B minus wire is going to be the, this is going to be hopefully the easiest one because we don't have to worry about shorting against any other conductors. You want to get this as close as you can, melt the solder, and then let it harden. Now it's very important that this makes a strong mechanical connection. So you want to really give it a fairly solid tug in, in multiple directions to make sure it's going to stay put. Otherwise, it runs the risk of popping off and short-circuiting and causing a fire. Now what we want to do is move on to the next cell. Now remember, the next cell is going to go over here to B1+. That was what we figured out uh, in the balancing, uh, with the balancing conductors. So the next cell up is the one directly adjacent to the black connection here. We'll trim this off here move the other wires out of the way, strip the insulation back, and we'll do the same thing with pre-tinning. Now before I install this one onto the actual board, I need to cover up this black conductor here, because this one is directly connected through the circuit board to that, and accidentally touching it with this will of course cause a short circuit. So I'm going to get some more tape off of the reel, off of the electrical tape, 
what I'm going to do is place this as close as I can around these black, uh, these black conductors here, but not so close to the other side as to cover up the soldering pad, because we still need to be able to solder to it. It's always good also to fold it over a little bit to make sure it stays secure. So now the soldering pad that we're going to be using is available, but we've shielded our connection against that, uh, that negatively grounded wire, which would otherwise short out. So the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to attack it from this angle. I don't want to put excessive strain on the board by having wires pushing across like that. So I'm going to get fairly close to it. This time I'm going to move in and Take the soldering iron. This is the, one of the more challenging bits. Heat it up enough to melt the solder, release it, and then of course do my mechanical test. So is it strong enough to stay on there? Looks like it is. Now we can peel back the electrical tape and make sure that we're not too close or don't have any tin whiskers that are going to likely approach the other side. So as you can see, we've completely attached this second balancing lead to the 1B plus connection, and there's, no, uh, there's a nice gap of roughly an eighth of an inch between that and the adjacent connection. Now the next cell that we're going to be attaching is the 2B plus cell, which is this one here. So we'll do the same thing by covering up B minus with some tape, and we'll do that connection. I won't show that on camera since it's basically the same procedure as before. So now as you can see, I have all of the balancing leads soldered onto the balancing board. Now as you recall from the er my earlier commentary on the failure mode of the previous battery pack, the MOSFETs on here can get extremely hot in the event that the cells are imbalanced during charging. So as an added layer of protection, I'm just going to put an extra piece of electrical tape in between these wires and the tops of the MOSFETs just so that if it melts the insulation on the wiring, it'll have that, that added layer of insulation just to make it less likely that the internal conductors would touch anything. Now I can also cover this entire board with a couple of layers of electrical tape. Not too much because I don't want to over uh, thermally insulate the MOSFETs and cause it to fail due to that high temperature, but enough that, I have, uh, that I'm protecting against any foreign metal objects inside the uh, inside the battery case from accidentally coming into contact with the board. And I'll do the same over here on the balancing side. This will also make it more convenient to uh, place the board someplace adjacent to the battery where it will be out of the way and unlikely to cause any sh sort of a short circuit. So now that I've wrapped that tape around here, this is our balancing system. So we've effectively precisely replicated what the original battery pack had and what the original battery pack would use to connect to this board. Now before we move any further, let's do a quick test to make sure that uh, we're getting power out of this balancing system. So I'm going to take this lead here and I'm going to plug it into the, uh, the circuit board here. And as you can see, the blue lights have turned on, indicating that the system is working properly. We'll disconnect that for now, since we won't be reconnecting it until we finish this project. Now the next thing we need to do here is we need to adapt this end piece connector to better replicate the EC5 connector that the original battery pack had on it. We also need to shorten the length of these leads substantially in order to get it to fit appropriately into this EC5 connector here on the side of the box. So I've placed our EC5 connector, the replacement connector, into this slot which is provided in the case. And based on that location, I've approximately estimated how much wire we're going to have to cut in order to snugly fit these conductors into the, well, into the pins that we're going to solder on and insert into this connector. Now, in order to prevent having the wires cross over the top of the battery pack, I've trimmed back some of the sheathing material from the battery to allow the wires to directly stick out. Now you don't want to trim all of the sheathing material off because that's what holds the three cells in place and also provides some compression which helps in prolonging their lifespan and reducing the chances of them puffing like the original one. So if you keep that sheathing in place, just trim a little bit back to get these wires 
sticking straight out, we can begin with the next process, which is preparing the wiring and the pins for the EC5 installation. So to prepare the EC5 connectors, we're first going to take one of these uh, gold-plated pins. Now for the female EC5 connector, which is the one that goes inside the Bolt Power G06, you're going to want to use the pin that has the spring-loaded tabs uh, that are coaxially surrounding a center cavity. This is the one that's going to then press into the receiving uh, male end. So what we're going to do is you want something that you can put down on the table that you're not afraid of getting burned. And you're going to want to take your soldering iron, some solder, and potentially a pair of needle nose pliers just to kind of guide this and hold it in place. If you have a third hand, that may also be helpful, a third hand being one of those devices with an alligator clip that can hold parts. And what we want to do is we want to flow some solder into the inside of the EC5 connector. Now this may take some time because you want to thoroughly heat the connector. Now you don't need to fill it up completely, you just need to get a little bit in and try to coat all the surrounding inside parts of it. When you get finished and it's ready, you want it to look something like this with just a little bit of solder kind of surrounded in. And I suppose you can add a little bit of extra. It probably, uh, as long as you don't fill it completely up, it should be absolutely fine. Now that we've primed that, we're going to begin by getting the battery itself now ready. Now for this part, we're only going to uh, be inserting one wire, soldering one wire and inserting it into this EC5 at a time. It's very important that you never let these two wires be exposed at any point at the same time, because if these two touch, it will cause the battery to short out and burst into flames. So that's extremely important. You want to make absolutely certain there's no chance these two will ever come directly into contact with one another. So we'll get some wire cutters and I'm going to cut the wire just past the predefined mark like so. We can fold this out of the way so it's not uh, anywhere near where we're going to be working. And next what we can do is take some scissors or a very sharp set of wire cutters and carefully strip off about a quarter inch of insulation from this connector. Now it's very important that you get a quarter or maybe slightly less than a quarter of, in, of an inch off because any more than that and you'll be left with exposed conductor that you'll have to deal with covering up later. So I've almost gotten that totally stripped. There's some on the back that's uh, still hanging on may require some additional coercion. So now what you want to do is you want to get it very uh, well, well sort of uh, twisted together so that it's not spreading out. And you want to flow in a little bit of solder just to pre-tin this. Not too much because you don't want to expand the conductors. I mean you don't want to add any volume to this. And you also want to be very careful to keep your dwell time relatively short because this is conducting heat straight down into the battery. So make sure you can always keep your fingers on this wire. You want to make sure that it never gets too hot to touch because that means the battery inside is experiencing that same heat. And that's the sort of thing that's going to cause trouble. So now that we've prepared the pin, the next step is going to be attaching it to the pre-tinned wire from the battery. Now I've set the camera up off the edge of the table so you can get a bird's eye view of how we're going to install this. I'm going to be using a regular Bic lighter and I'm going to heat up this pin using the lighter and then once it has sat under the flame for maybe 10 to 15 seconds, I'm going to press it onto the wire until it fully mates on and then I'll release the heat. So here it goes. So I'm heating up the pin now. And I want to give it maybe 10 seconds or so. Now I'm going to start moving it onto the conductor. So we need to transfer a lot of heat in and you want to twist it back and forth. You can hold the battery with the finger if you can and hopefully if it reaches in properly it's going to make contact. That looks pretty good. Let's let this cool down now. You don't want to let the flame get too close to the battery when you're applying it because you want to make sure you don't burn any of the surrounding insulation. That could have potentially disastrous results. And make sure that it's cool enough to touch before you test it with the pliers. What I suggest, what I strongly suggest doing is holding the wire with your fingers and giving it a really strong tug, also potentially giving it kind of a twisting motion to make sure that it's properly sealed in place. 
And uh, that should, in theory, provide a satisfactory connection. Now I'm going to try to drift the pin in using a hammer and a sharp uh, flat blade screwdriver. As you can see now, we've popped the pin in place, and with a little bit more adjustment, we'll be able to get it perfectly centered. Let me do that now. You can tell the EC5 is connected perfectly when, if you look down the barrel of it, you can just see the spring-loaded tabs, and you can rotate it freely without easily pulling it off from either side. So this side is now connected properly. So now I've successfully installed both sides of the EC5 connector. With this in mind, I also uh, took the time to secure the balancing connector to the back side of the, of the pack. That way when we insert it, it doesn't just flap around. And we'll be able to install this uh, EC5 connector into the actual pack, into the actual brick. Once that's in place, we'll make sure that this reconnects and everything works, and we'll package the whole thing up. So I'm now going to insert this into the battery brick case. Now it looks like I cut the wires a little bit long, but I wanted to do that to make sure I wasn't in danger of overheating the cells. So first we'll slip the EC5 connector in like that, and then I'll see if I can just press the rest of the battery into its resting place. So now that I've verified that it fits, I'm going to pull it back out and put some, uh, some padding underneath so that it doesn't press into the hard plastic underneath. So I've reinstalled the top portion of the battery brick, and I've also added some uh, strips of padding to protect the battery against the plastic grooves on the bottom. So now I'm going to reinsert the EC5 connector, line up the battery so that it fits snugly but uh, is not overly compressed in this package. And I'm going to also install the power cables to supply the board. Now that I've connected the board, you can see three out of the four LEDs have lit, indicating that the battery was charged somewhere from 50 to 75% from the factory, which is a normal storage charge for a lithium polymer battery. So now we can fold this top portion over, and we want to line it up to make sure nothing's getting smashed or damaged. And that looks pretty good. Now I'm going to check to see if the battery rattles around at all. Doesn't look like it. So uh, now that's weird. OK, so the battery fits properly, but it looks like the EC5 is not lined up quite properly. So I'll open it up and I'll troubleshoot that for a little bit. So after a bit of adjustment, I managed to get the EC5 connector realigned into the correct location. Now that all there's left to do is to put the screws in, pack it all up, and go and do some tests. So as you can see here, all the standard functions with the flashing uh, road flare light, the flashlight, as well as the DC to DC converter system are working properly. I'll give it a bit of a charge, and then we'll go out and uh, see if we can use the EC5 to do some engine cranking. So I've given the battery brake a little bit of a top-up charge. It's still less than 75%, but I'm going to give it a try anyway. I've connected the EC5 connectors to the cable clamps, and we're going to be trying to start this 3.6 liter Jeep engine next. So I'm going to comp I've completely disconnected the negative terminal from the battery, so there, the battery will play no role whatsoever in doing this engine start. I'm going to attach my positive lead here to the positive terminal, and I'm going to attach the negative lead to the negative terminal. I guess the car is drawing a little power. Now I'm going to go and start it and see if we can make it work. Pretty impressive that that battery could do that start. That's what 75C continuous 150C peak can do for you. And as you can see, the voltage never went low enough to actually trigger the BMS to turn it off. So that battery is still perfectly healthy. So now that I've shown you that this battery replacement worked, all the functionality is still working with this system, and it even starts a 3.6 liter engine. So Bolt Power G06 battery replacement, success. Thanks for watching Dielectric videos. I will see you next time.